Hey everybody, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of The Game Maker's Notebook, I sat down with the CEO of CCP Games, Hilmar Peterson. He had just finished a talk at Dice Reykjavik on the past, present, and future of EVE Online, which is one of the longest running games in our industry's history. Hilmar and I jumped right into the deep end, discussing the incredible social dynamics and economic forces that have evolved in the game over the past two decades. We talked about the partnership that the developers have with their players and the responsibility they feel when even the tiniest of tweaks can send ripples through a galactic economy. Hilmar also shared exciting information about Eve's next expansion, Vanguard, which is a next step in realizing CTP's vision of what they're calling Eve Online Forever. Please join us. Zarzak has been waiting. An ancient nexus long abandoned. Now ruled by the insurgents, the fearless, the deathless. Trust is rare among our kind. Yet here you are, compelled by my invitation. I offer you a haven, a fortress, hidden from the Empire. I have given it life. It feeds on me. And in return, it yields knowledge, gifts, power. Prepare your forces for chaos on the front lines. Harness the might of capsuleers with the promise of riches. And together, we will unlock Zarzak's secrets. One by one. Hilmar, hey, it's, it's awesome to have you on this show. Yeah, it's great to be here. And it's funny, here is Iceland. Yes. I say it's funny because usually when I'm talking to people, it's we're not able to get together physically, but I flew all the way to Iceland to talk to you. Yes. Well, it's very appreciated. I'm very <laughs> excited to talk to you. Yeah. Actually, it is that we are here at Dice uh, in Iceland, and you have just finished up a massive player fan fest, right, for CCP? Yes. Uh, last week, we were celebrating uh, 20 years of Eve Online. So um, we were doing that in our sports arena here. We um, actually had to move to a bigger venue than usual because uh, we we saw what the trajectory was. This was our biggest fan event in all of history of the game. Wow. Um, I think we counted about 3,000 people that ran through the sports stadium throughout all the days we were doing the events, which is, which is a lot for people in Iceland. I mean, it's... Uh, it's like a percent of the nation. <laughs> so so all of the local vendors are very happy, right? Because you're increasing the revenue significantly with this influx of fans. Actually, it is quite um, notorious within Reykjavik when EVE players come to Reykjavik. They, they all kind of present themselves in like a similar way. They're like a cohort of people. Everyone is wearing like EVE gear and swag and often they're all playing in like kind of space fantasy clothes kind of okay um and it is the the feedback from everyone from like cab drivers from people working in bars and restaurants 
that these are the most polite tourists that come to Iceland. They they are like I've I've seen like in the internal messaging board of the of the service industry of Reykjavik, they they they, they make a particular note of just how polite and organized and and nice Eve players are. Wow. Now, does that run counter to your experiences online with Eve players? So there, there, there are maybe two facets to that. I think the impression generally externally is that Eve Online is a game of betrayal and skullduggery, of like um, heists and, and, and connivings and massive warfare, etc. cetera. Um, and this is all true. But there is something about like people that have such an outlet for that online. The people that come to Iceland, they seem to really just leave all that on the screen mm. and are the most nice self-adjusted people when they are here in reality. Then we have this kind of weird in-between where people are online talking about the game and talking to us. People of EVE Online hold CCP to a very high standard. And that can be very sometimes aggressive. Mm. Um, so the 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 dystopian hellscape of email line gets really all those feelings out in people, and they get to kind of leave them on the screen when they're here in the first term. They are the nicest humans I ever meet. But there is this place in between where people are kind of online but not in the game. That's kind of where uh, it, it can get a bit of both. So that's when you're getting the fan suggestions perhaps for how the game could be improved yes suggestions okay. it's uh, strongly <laughs> worth it suggestions we get a lot of them yes i guess that mo it probably is shared by most developers but in your case because the game has been running for so long i imagine those uh there are even sort of waves of suggestions where you can identify you know the categories of suggestions and how and prepare for how acerbic they may be yeah right yeah. So, uh, I mean, there are aspects of Eve Online where we are we are taking care of a game, game mechanics, frames per second, etc. Those kind of things. It's kind of the sort of base layer of the game is that it is running and it runs well. Mm -hmm. But then we have a lot of sort of rules of the universe, which uh, uh, have a vast uh, impact on the economy. So uh, sometimes we do have to tune the rules of the universe because for something to be uh, sustainable for 20 years. We certainly didn't just get it out in one go and it was right. We've had to tune and tweak as life goes on. Mostly kind of at the physics layer, a little bit on the economy layer. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, it affects the political dynamics. Oh, sure. I'm so imagine. some people have maybe accumulated strategic advantage by occupying a certain niche in the game. So every time we make a balance, it is almost like politics. So people do engage in political campaigns to advocate for their cause. And that can be quite like any political campaigns and any politicians we know, quite scathing. And, and we, like many game developers, contact with the fact that our audiences are very passionate and hold us to a high standard, and it's not always pretty. Um, and, and that is something we contend with, like people coming into working at CCP to touch him online, you can just imagine just graduated, graduated from school, and then you've just organized political campaigns, maybe criticizing some mistake you did. It's a lot to contest with. And, and we have made these venues like FanFest, like our consular stellar management, to kind of get people closer together. Because like I said, if players leave the violence on the screen and they're in person, they're super nice. Yeah. The in-between online interactions are a mixed bag, but in person, it's so much more efficient. So. We have uh, had this consular stellar management. We fly them into Iceland once or twice per year to mm. discuss the game. Super productive. Get people here to Iceland. And we also go to events around the world. Super productive. And, and these are kind of mechanisms which, which sort of deeply affect the, the trajectory of the game. Well, that's fascinating. So I, I wasn't planning to ask you about this, but it sounds like this council is really your house of representatives or yes. in America, we have yep. representatives who represent large percentages of the population. Yeah. And so they're representing the population's desires to you, yes. the executive branch, right? Yeah. And, yes. and you ultimately decide what you want to do. Is that absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Okay. You nailed it. Um, the, 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 the U S system in particular is, uh, is a really good model. I mean, every democracy has their 
sort of separation of the different branches so of yeah. like executive and legislative and judicial. But the, the representatives and Senate in America is a very good model. This is very much like a House of Representatives. Okay. We still haven't created a Senate. I, I've often fantasized of like what a Senate and a Supreme Court would be like. Right. But we are at least working on this sort of representative level. And we do spend a lot of time making sure that this Council of Stellar Management is really representing the different constituencies with the online. We have a rather elaborate voting system mm. to uh, increase the the representation. I mean, again, going back to the U.S., I think everyone can agree that the original constitution was maybe not like created for the current political climate. Right. I think various sort of discussions at the time literally said the system will fail down if there are national parties. Yeah. Because this was very much driven by the states, more like a European Union kind of set up in a way. But now that you have global global state political parties, which are two factions duking it out, the representative system is is not really built for that. I mean, they and the and the designers of it really said that. So so we've kind of taken some inspiration off that. You need to keep your system to assure representation uh dynamic. Yeah. Well, make that makes sense too. And by the way, there isn't, I, I probably, I misspoke a little bit earlier and with equating you to the executive branch, because in, at least in the United States form of government, those checks and balances yeah. pretty much ensure that there isn't one particular branch that's going to have power, but ultimately the game developer makes the decision, but it's a well-informed decision is what it sounds like, right? Yeah. Yes. We, 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 we do hold a lot of power because we cannot only change the the kind of the the law of the land we can change the physics so we we have various types of agency and on a on a on a certain level we have like godly powers yeah. over him online sure um, and it even is a challenge for us to sometimes organize ourselves in what agency are we acting are we are we demonst- are we leveraging our godly powers are we leveraging our legislative powers? Are we leveraging our executive powers? Like they, we, we have various kind of forms, how we interact with the world. And, and this is very complicated to organize even in your own head. Yeah. So uh, understanding how you kind of create these sort of layers, or it's almost like a protocol design for like a network stack or something like that. I'm a former CTO, so I, I map over to these models. Okay. <laughs> so there's a part of the onboarding of like coming to work on email line is just understanding like, okay, on this layer, we behave like this and we have to consult people in this fashion. On this layer, it's different, et cetera. So, yeah. so this, this is in many ways kind of like not only running a, a, a small country, but also like organizing the weather and nature and everything uh, all in one. That's a lot of responsibility. And I just have to ask one more uh, a question using the governmental analogy. Yeah. Do you ever imagine a Supreme Court of some sort that it, uh, serves as sort of the arbiter of these big decisions? Yes. That's it's sort of objective? Yeah, it's it's definitely in my brain is an objective because the this there's too much centralization of these responsibilities. And it puts a, a lot of pressure on us on being kind of good stewards of that massive responsibility. And what, what, what it is also, when you have powers to change everything, you can sometimes, maybe not like a, abuse them per se, but often it's just easier to change them here yeah. la- rather than to change them somewhere else. Like uh, the lower you go in the stack, the more complicated it is. So often we're maybe patching in another layer rather than addressing the fundamental problem and, and, and vice versa, instead of like patching, we just like change the, the, the foundations a bit. And, 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 um, and, and we have to self-discipline ourselves. Hmm. Um, and obviously we're accountable to the players of you online who, uh, if they're not happy with how we organize things, you can just like log off and leave. So, I mean, there are accountability dynamics, but, um, further sort of bringing them closer, kind of like a Supreme Supreme Court construct or like a Senate construct mm-hmm. um, would help us in further sort of compartmentalizing all these different challenges that yeah. are involved in operating a virtual society. And, uh, and, and one of the 
maybe the 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 strongest one is that probably the 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 biggest responsibility in any community is deciding who is in and who's out like um and we have the power to do that yeah. we are kind of in a way police and judge in a lot of activities which are against the EU law of the game or and against sort of unwritten rules in the game etc where we identify behavior and we ban people for, for it but i mean it's a big just i think value for mankind is forgiveness mm-hmm. if there's no recourse to redeem yourself then um it's not like a great setup like the you you there should be a recourse to come back through some redemption path and and forgiveness is a like a, a deep value i think all mankind shares so um then we are holding both the uh, pushing you out and pulling you back in power yeah and and that is just again puts a lot of responsibility on us on self moderating our own actions but having the ability of like something like a supreme court that could review cases for like a very clear example if like if you're banned in the game can you appeal the ban or can you appeal for redemption based on like okay I've, it's now been 10 years and I've really <laughs> tried to improve. And I do get these letters. Really? I do get letters from people. And they, this is not uncommon where they say, it's been 10 years, Hilmar. Uh, can I come back? And I I just I don't feel great that it's going to be based on my opinion. Right. Like, it's just it's not a lot that, of responsibility. It's a lot, lot of responsibility. And I, and I feel like there's also this challenge of being consistent, right? If you have people who are being banned for one thing or another and the yeah. and the game evolves and or your thinking evolves, yeah. how can you ensure fairness? Absolutely. Right. And we're all just people. Yeah. So I think that's that's a really cool idea to have that objective board. Talk about taking pressure off of the team. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So we do think a lot about these constructs. Like if this is a virtual society, virtual nation, virtual city, whatever part of them, how can we best set it up? so that it is the most autonomous it can be yeah. where where we are really truly the janitors we're just like cleaning up the place and fixing the plumbing and and things like that but all the but you know, the difference is that if you in terms of fixing the plumbing shut off one pipe ripple effect across the entire universe right yes. so yeah. so with that in mind how do you measure those ripples whenever you make a, a sort of a fundamental tweak to the game yeah, I mean, we have a lot of infrastructure uh, we have built over time to um, have kind of various sort of um, sort of KPIs about the economy, about the social economy. We have now been developing a new great one, which is called the Friendship Index. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can we can measure whether friendship, uh, if those beautiful things about uh, creating new friendships, which is a rare and beautiful thing in the. In the, in the world overall, but particularly rare in the world we've been living for the past 10 years, yep. where friendship, and lo- friendship is on the decline, loneliness on the rise. So we've developed a, a way to measure friendship in the economy uh, through a KPI we developed because we have, we have godly insights into be- behavior. So, so then we can see, okay, if we do a certain change, are we increasing or decreasing by proxy love in the world hmm. because like friendship is an expression of love. Um, and, uh, and, uh, so we, we develop these things to understand, okay, now we're doing something here. Are there unintended consequences in the economy, in the social economy, in the sort of human relatedness and things like that? Also we do like, okay, is this ship too overpowered? Now everyone is flying this one ship which is also like more basic stuff. Yeah. It's not all like love and belonging and big ideas about Supreme Courts. They're also making spaceships and... <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. But I love the idea that you're taking all of this disparate data and forming conclusions about yeah. the game, especially things, esoteric concepts like friendship. So yeah. how would you define friendship? So um, um, we uh, we we... We, we have ways for people to self-report friendship. And okay. we just ask them, do we have a friend in Eve? Um, why, why do you think you have a friend in Eve? And it's usually uh, somebody has my back or somebody is willing to help me if I, if I make a mistake, um, which I think are kind of functional 
descriptions of friendship. Okay. Um, but I, I have been actually thinking about it a lot myself. Like, is there a way to push that deeper? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, and from friendship, you, you get very soon to love, um, uh, because friendship is a form of love. Um, I mean, you have love for many things. You might love your wife, uh, children, your parents and your friends, like the, the love expresses itself in many different ways. And then, okay, now we need to define love. Okay. It didn't really become much simpler, but, but, uh, thinking backtracking again, is there a game design construct you can reason about where love is the output? Um, and I found a quote from Thomas Aquilius. It's like a priest philosopher from 1200 something. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, love is to will the good of another. It's like a powerful statement. Sure. So to, to will the good of another is like you are going to invest your will in that good things happen to another person. In, in a, and, and, and it doesn't have to express selflessness. It's, it, it's in a way implied in the, in the sort of sparsity of the words. Yeah. So then you, then you can think, okay, whom in your life will you will good? And it, and it becomes very obvious you, you're willing the good of your children. Like the, uh, the, the, the I think that's a universal truth. Yeah. Uh, I think every single human on earth that has children wills them good. And okay, so now you can build them good. And then there's a kind of a shocking corollary. Then there has to be an opportunity for bad things to happen. There's no way to like, you, you need to will good the more danger and bad things can happen. So counterintuitively for willing another person good. You have to create a bad place so that being good and being a friend has meaning. So, um, and this, we kind of have reasoned through 20 years of like what we thought was a capitalistic hellscape, but it creates all this love and beauty. Mm -hmm. And there's some like yin yang of like, so we, we very much think like, is there counterintuitively a way to create more pain and suffering? So that love and belonging has an even like brighter relevance. There's something like in the darkness, the light is the purest. Yeah. So like increasingly we think of the world, it's a, it's a dystopia and, and by creating dystopia, not utopia, dystopia, people bring the light. Yeah. That's, was that one of your original concepts or did that sort of grow as your player base grew? So, um, it was intuition, like okay. the, the first line written in the design script of Eve was death is a serious matter. Mm. So I, I think the, the, the intuition about like, okay, death matters. And that correlates into the death penalty of Eve Online, which is severe. But well, let's, it, let's explain to people who don't play, play yes. Eve, what does severe mean? So, um, everything in the world of Eve is made by somebody like. Uh, to have a spaceship, you either have to build your own spaceship or you have to accumulate money in the game, to like in-game money, to buy the spaceship from somebody ha that has made it. You can't buy a spaceship with earthly money from CCP. Like we make no spaceships. Everyone makes the spaceships. So the every single unit of a spaceship is in a way a labor of love from either yourself or somebody else. If you end up in a fight in, in a spaceship and the spaceship explodes, it's gone forever. It's just gone. And it's painful to have it go, especially if it was like a po big proportion of your effort in the game encapsulated in this spaceship. Yeah. If it goes away, then it's like you have a huge vacuum. It's very painful. I've had it happen to myself. And it's like, it's, it's, I, I, I was, I was shaking like, a, and I was like, how can this be happening? Like this, this, I mean, I, I, I was deeply involved in making the game. Like how can the game then <laughs> have me feel like 
the devastating loss, like to a point, like I, it's happened to me early in life. And I, I just like, I don't think I've experienced this. Like this is, this is deeply impactful um, and painful. Um, and then there is something like when you're in that state of feeling that death penalty of like having made a mistake in the game, usually at the behest of some other person, they, you end up like resetting that person a lot. And I have a person that did it to me in Italy, still on a list. <laughs> of somebody that you want to re seek revenge? <laughs> yes. Against? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't revenged and i kind of forgiven by now, but it's been 20 <laughs> years. And the people that help you out of that, you, mm. you develop like very appreciative um, feelings on the reciprocation side. So how, how does somebody help you out of a situation where you've lost a ship you've put hundreds of hours into? Or maybe thousands in some yeah. cases. So in this particular case where I lost my first ship, I had borrowed it from a space friend. Borrowed uh, it? Yeah, borrowed okay. it from a friend in a corporation I was playing with. I okay. was playing anonymously uh, with some people um, who were doing kind of basic sort of high-sec gameplay, as it's called. I had borrowed their spaceship because they owned a bigger spaceship than I had. And I wanted to contribute more to the group we were in. So the person was logging off. I say, hey, can I borrow your spaceship? Then I will be able to mine more and contribute more to the group. Um, and then I take the spaceship and like, okay, we go and exchange. We actually have to go to another station. And um, I'm like, get the spaceship back. I'm in the spaceship for the first time. It's like a Thorax, which is a cruiser class spaceship. And I set like an autopilot back to where we were mining. Yeah. And I foolishly go to the restroom. And then when I come back, I see the escape pod on the screen, like the, and, and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't <laughs> check the flight path because you can go through dangerous areas. Yeah. <gasps> so stupid. <laughs> and then I see like the, the escape pod and I, I, I like was uh, programming the graphics engine. So like the escape pod, I've, I've watched it many times. Like I, I know it in detail, but seeing it in the context where it's now the, the manifestation of my mistake of having just borrowed this spaceship and then lost it through a stupid mistake. And then I'm like, okay, I'm like, and I was the CTO at the time. <laughs> I can just make a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I become deeply disappointed to myself yeah. about like cheating in right. the game. Yeah. And, and okay, why does it feel like cheating? It's quote unquote, <laughs> just a game, but it felt deeply like cheating. And then I'm like disappointed in this, like, oh, why did I even think about it? So I, I kind of go back to my friend and explain, uh, okay, <laughs> I lost the spaceship, you just borrowed me. And he was so understanding and he just um, gave me money, space money to go and, and, and buy a ship and and it just said me like, okay, now you, you will be able to generate more money in the game and, and you will pay me back. So, wow. And, and then going from this deep sense of loss to this deep sense of disappointment in myself for thinking about cheating mm -hmm. to this ray of hope of like, oh, he's fine. And not only that, he's helping me to kind of settle my own internal condition. And I spent like a few weeks <laughs> in the conundrum. Should I as CTO be fixing the game <laughs> or should I as a e player be honoring my <laughs> relationship to this person which has been so kind to me? That is wonderful. What a great commentary on uh, how deep that game, the game is. Yeah. And uh, I, I understand better now <laughs> how it can really hit people hard. Yeah. So what happens though to a person who loses a, a ship, for example, in the game and has to face that sort of look into the abyss and, and ask themselves, well, do I want to keep going? How yeah. do you keep people from go falling off that cliff? Yeah. So, um, um, there, there, there are a few kind of paths to address that. Like number one is the context of like why it happened. Um, can you understand in a game mechanical sense, what your mistake was and that can be quite difficult to do um, on behalf of the game. Uh, so there, there, there are um, spaceship combat, as you can imagine, can be quite a complicated affair. 
So you can often not have a very clear view when you're just beginning. What did I really do wrong? So finding a way on the game's behalf to kind of replay the sequence, like break it down, mm. identify so that I now can at least learn from it. Yeah. Which is like anything in life. You make a mistake. I mean, and, and it's, not, it's not really a failure if you learn from it. And you just become better at not making it again. We know this well from making games. Like it's riddled with uh, doing the wrong things. That's what on we the do. way to getting the right <laughs> thing. So, um, so that's one, trying to do that. Uh, we, I mean, we, we could do a lot better there. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we, 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 we will continue to rest in. But EVE players in the meantime have compensated a bit. So it is a very common affair if you're a new player starting today. And if you lose your spaceship, it's very common that the counterparty will come to you and explain what you did wrong hmm. and give you money to recover. Wow. Because EVE players that have been playing EVE for a very long time are extremely appreciative of new people joining. Yeah. Because uh, it's a big social economy, like new people into the economy is a good thing. Just like we generally like love the idea of new children being born. Like we look at children, we, we get this inspiration of like, well, they're all adorable. And new players are like, <laughs> by expression, <laughs> adorable. Uh, adorable. <laughs> um, but they need to be taught the game. Yeah. And so if players do a lot of things, sometimes even <laughs> killing them and then explaining <laughs> what, what was done wrong, very elaborative. And that is kind of the, the and the kindness kind of just all in one. Yeah. Uh, then there is social support. Like the best way to play online is really just to join some of the established corporations. And they have onboarding programs like it would put any company to shame. No kidding. Yeah. If, if I look at their onboarding program, these are like HR and they have HR departments, HR department onboarding programs involving university classes about like the compact system of Eve Online on YouTube and in person and then simulated warfare was like now all the new players are going to go together, fight a bunch of all the new players in a play fight. And then, okay, we're going to learn from that. We're going to do a post-mortem and we're going to redistribute the assets. If players do this and they have elaborate Excel sheets and teaching materials and wikis and like, oh my God. That is wonderful. It's amazing. And so how many, well, do other corporations, do you encourage other corporations to take a look at these onboarding programs or, or get involved in EVE? Because I think to your point, it's one of the hardest things to do in any company is to have a really compelling hooky onboarding. Absolutely. Um, well, we mostly focus on ourselves. Sure. Like how, yeah. how can we learn from e-players? Well, number one, to make their jobs of onboarding people into their organizations inside EVE a little bit easier. Yeah. Because we can make tools where not everything has to be like from the ground up, just sort of engineered mostly in Excel. Yeah. And recently we added actually an Excel integration into the game for those purposes. Which like, is great. I mean, yeah, that I makes mean, a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, it's not only the meme, Excel in space becoming real. <laughs> it's just really like necessary. Big part of what people do is, is onboarding programs. Um, so we, we, we study that mostly to give them better tools and enhance our own onboarding into the game. Makes sense. Um, but we do sometimes comment, like um, sort of inspire our onboarding teams in the company to like, okay, what lessons can we learn from how, how, how the... Space corporations on part of their, their, their new recruits. Well, I love, I love the idea that this is, in, in some ways, a reflection of, you know, as you've said, capitalistic society. You yeah. use, I think, more, more pejorative terms, but I, I feel like you've given so many players just free reign yeah. and watched the economy grow, the social dynamics blossom and yeah. change over, over yeah. the years. It's a, it's, I, I, I don't know of any other Petri dishes like this in our industry. And, and you've also, I know you talked publicly about how it's been studied yeah. in yes. universities, right? Absolutely. Your economy. And so yeah. have, <laughs> jumping to the economy part versus the social dynamics part, have you all become economists? Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we, we do hire many economists okay. and we have many economists. Uh, and I think just by exposure and just by necessity, uh, we, have, we have become uh, quite... Uh, learn it about the relevance part of, of economy design. Uh, and we've also come to realize, again, going back to the earlier parts of the conversation, 
is again the agency stack. The economy exists in a certain part in the stack of what we're responsible for. Okay. And it's actually how you modify more of the foundation of the game, how that emerges into the economy. So the the like if we go back to Earth and if we think about like, okay, why is there an economy on Earth in the first place? Like instead of like understanding and studying the economy, if you go back to the conceit of it, where did it come from and why does it exist? The it largely exists because of specialization of individual humans and the topology of resource distribution on Earth. So these two things are the foundation of why a, an economy is a solution. So let, let's break it down a little bit further. So if we are like um, two humans in early human life and you're going to make arrows and I'm going to hunt deer, like we, we, we're going to specialize. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you're going to be good, really good at making the arrows and I'm going to be really good at shooting them and getting the deer. And then maybe a third person is going to like cut up the deer, take the skin and make leather and make jewelry out of the antlers and things like that. So there's a lot of specialization. So, I mean, ultimately we're getting food and clothes and things out of the business of making arrows, shooting deer and processing them into, into valuable things. So we now have kind of a part of the economy of like, okay, I'll, I'll, like once you have done the, 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 the deer, I get some of the meat, I get some of the skin and you too, because we three contributed to the outcome of what you have now. Yeah. And this becomes like a part of the economy of like, okay, I specialize in this, you specialize in this, and we share in the collective outcomes. This doesn't scale very well. So people started to use seashells to become mediums of exchange and accumulation of wealth, et cetera, et cetera. And then we invented coins and then we started to print and then we make just virtual money. So it all came out of the fact that we did specialize in hunting the deer and processing the outcome. Then if you look at the geopolitical situation on the planet, then, okay, the, all the oil is over here, all the uranium is over here, all the copper is over here. Now we have a global economy of resource uh, distribution and cultures which have kind of occupied the niches. Now they have to do international trade. That's done through like international trade agreements and bit of arguing about borders and all these things. So, and, and that came out of specialization mm -hmm. and resource distribution. It's really the economy is from there. So when we have the ability to change all these things, both what can you specialize in and where are the things uh, distributed on, you often use topology, like mm -hmm. what is the relationship of like, I need to go down this river because I went to the mountains and it's hard to go through the forest and that to us like a topology, it's easier to go down a river than the river is very important. So we have created a world which is full of these kind of asymmetries of distribution, topology of, of landscape, and then a lot of uh, specialization you can do. And then the em uh, economy emerges. And yeah. then you have to look at the economy. Okay, am I fixing the economy or am I fixing the nature that produced it? Um, so you have, to th you have to reason about this very clearly. And often you need like physicists or like ecologists to operate on this layer, an economist on this layer. Then you need like social scientists and so psychologists and fashion designers and like, and pretty pretty soon you just have all human disciplines kind of flowing into the company to figure this out. That's, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, that's true world building, right? That's universe building. So. Yes, that, that is universe building, yes. And, uh, and the fun part is slowly, slowly, slowly over time becoming better at it. Well, it seems to me that the players are helping a lot as well. And yes. you've, you've made this a collaboration with players versus a sort of a divide between war, war developers, your players. And I think it shows in your talk today at DICE and, and basically all of your online presence. You, you welcome players. Yes. You make them part, yeah. almost part of CCP, it seems. Yes, yes. We, we want to adopt the, the role of being janitors in this yeah. and not this huge stack of interactions because it, uh, again, as we talked about earlier, it's a lot of responsibility. It's, it's, it's in many ways fragile, like the, the individual humans and their opinions and feelings mm -hmm. are a fragile thing. So you want to set it up like where you have representative, you have Senate, you have, you have um, Supreme Court, you have local legislations, you have the you've kind of privatized the police, et cetera, because that 
like mm. is is more sort of anti fragile like then you have societies and ec ecologies of humans solving the problems not just like a person with an opinion and forcing it on the many yeah well, I, that it's great to hear that philosophy explained mm. uh, so with so many people involved in eve online so many players and so many players taking advantage of real life skills and building skills what kind yeah. of impact do you think eve is having on economies on culture mm. so <clears throat> um we we have we, we sort of started this like five years ago like and and we've done a bit of it throughout the the the, the 20 year journey is to kind of try to find the treasure of insight which is almost hidden in the world because it's been millions of people playing um, a fairly sophisticated society simulation right. for 20 years. And we have all the data captured. So we're not like a research institution in the real world that has to infer through statistics what went on, like uh, the job of a, how you find out if there is inflation or not inflation in the economy is largely guessing based on statistics, like the central bank doesn't really know. They, they have no ability to capture what's going on in the economy. We do have the ability to capture it because it's all just persistent in a database. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's a little bit like finding the forest for the trees because it's, it's all the data literally. But we have been working with universities. We've built up our own research teams on just like finding these nuggets of insights of like, okay, what, number one, can we improve this situation? And what, number two, okay, is there a way to reflect on our own world? through the insights gathered here. And obviously that is better done through academia. And we have worked with universities that have published many papers about insights from online that inform our current state. And again, I don't really want to be involved in having opinions about the current state mm. of the world. It becomes highly political very quickly. I just want to focus on these politics and not the other ones, but universities certainly do that. But, but we are always trying to find these nuggets to kind of further reinforce this and create something like the friendship index and the economy index and all these things. One of the insights we've, we've found like, and it's largely in this idea of like, okay, thousands of people have been playing this game for 20 years. Yeah. Why? Like in a very grand sense, why? And I mean, I have ideas, but like, how about we, we systematically um, involve them in explaining it back to us? And then we came up with this concept that is largely two things. It's the friendship we were talking about earlier. And then it is the skill set. People believe and, and believe, I mean, in the perception is reality. They believe that Eve has made them or, or, or developed in them skills because of its intensity of the environment. It's all very consequential, high death penalty, complicated tasks coordination of people and skill sets and specializations, et cetera, long-term planning, the great to execute it, many devastated losses along the way that you have to pull yourself up to. I mean, you've been making games. It's not easy. Nope. Just imagine like. It's a crucible. Really. Yeah. It's I mean, a crucible. Yeah. Crucible. Great word. Yeah. Like uh, the crucible of making games is the crucible of playing. You, like, that's, you know what? <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, just like you develop many skills from doing that. Sure. I've seen you speak on stage about the act of making games. It's very, very learned and inspiring because it's giving you skills from doing that. Sure. Um, and this happens also to players and that becomes like leadership, conflict management, uh, grit and resilience and healthy skepticism while having an open mind. So you see this kind of tapestry of of, of, of human psychology being kind of reinforced in a way that gives people the feeling that they have become a better version of themselves or yeah. like an enhanced version of themselves um, through Eve. And I mean, uh, I mean, just try to go through our new player experience. Your 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 brain just like becomes <laughs> a size bigger from doing it. <laughs> well, that's I I do want to talk about the new player experience for yeah. a moment, but I do also want to acknowledge that. It has been wonderful reading stories about the corporations and the diplomatic alliances and the immense complexity of the social relationships that exist in EVE and how people are developing, in particular, leadership skills. Yes. That is great. And I think that when people have an appreciation for how 
uh, leaders operate, how leaders maybe operate poorly sometimes. Yeah. That's a that's a great help for our society too. Yeah. Because hopefully it, it inspires more people to do that in real life and step up and take responsibility for whatever it is, their dream, like making yes. their dream come true or yeah. uh, helping their organization, maybe their charity move ahead because they have gotten this experience in terms of uh, aligning very mm -hmm. disparate interests in yeah. something like Eve. Absolutely. The, and, cool. and and you mentioned charities. It's, a, it's actually a, a great to kind of build it from there because, I mean, when we are running companies, we, we have the power that we're paying people a salary, uh, which is very important and necessary for them to gain from somewhere. Mm. It's our economic construct. But in EVE Online, okay, there's money in the game, but the money is like fictional. Yeah. It's, it's not really useful outside of the game. Uh, it's a little bit like the money in Iceland. You take some of the Icelandic money back home to the US, it will do you no good. Monopoly money is better than Icelandic money in the US. <laughs> so the Icelandic money only works here in Iceland. EVE money only works in EVE. Um, so you don't have that tool that people have to do it. Um, and, and, and sometimes companies just rely on it. Like I'm paying your salary. You should just be happy about that. Right. And, and that's enough. Uh, leadership in EVE does not have that tool. So they have to work even harder on all the things you should be doing, even if you have the power of paying people a salary, because that is what leadership do. The other is just a mechanic that exists. It's like a, it's like a tool. It's not the actual job. So you get these purer insights. And like when you talk to EVE players about leadership, it's in many ways humbling. Like some of the largest EVE alliances are like tens of thousands of people organized across the globe in time zones and culture differences and agendas and God knows what. And there is like a leadership team in all of these companies. It's always a team uh, that takes care of leading tens of thousands of people in often virtual warfare, which makes it even more tense for decades. That's insane. And in, in the fact that well, I, I would imagine these people are incredibly capable probably amazing communicators, yes. really object, hopefully fairly yeah. objective and can deal with conflict and crisis, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That, Absolutely. I mean, I, it's easy to ignore that when, if you're outside of the Eve community, but when you, I, again, yeah. I would encourage everybody who's listening to read some of the stories and, and, and appreciate the experience that these folks are, are getting running yeah. essentially 10,000 person companies. Absolutely. Right? And, and they then often, um, um, go and fund their own companies in reality. No kidding. And crediting, like, okay. I mean, I was doing this in EVE. Now I'm doing it here on planet Earth. It seems way simpler. You can pay people <laughs> salary. You like get actual revenue. Like, oh my God, this is kid stuff. <laughs> what I was doing over here in the space fantasy, that was hard work. Right. And I'm not like being sort of facetious about it. It's really what they say. Well, I can imagine it's 100% <laughs> charisma, right? I mean, that's what you, it seems like you gotta have yeah. or, or diplomacy skills yeah. to actually manage teams like that. Well, you also, and in your talk, one of the things that got me was that how, how players have been inspired to give back. Mm -hmm. And most recently what you raised five, the players raised $500,000 for Ukraine. Yes. That's incredible. It is really incredible. Truly humbling. And, uh, and this is all players just band together, decide to yep. do this on their own. Yes. They, they, they donate. We have like a currency called Plex, which is kind of a currency equivalent to real world money so we can cash it out in a way. So people uh, collect that together, uh, give it to us and we cash it out to real money uh, for charity. And um, and this we've been doing, uh, it actually started in 2004 with the Southeast Asia tsunami. Um, and then since like a long series of of uh, disasters in the world, the e-players have banded together to do their to their bit to, to help. And it's actually, there's like a, Corollary from that, like why does that occur? And it's it relates again to our studies of the e player base. And um, um, you would think like, okay, capitalistic hellscape, PVP, death penalty, it's all like very sort of aggressive, competitive people which are here. And, and sure, there is a bit of that. It is a fairly uh, small minority. Mm. The uh, the, the biggest cohort of players in EVE 
uh, self-identify as helpers. They, they like to help others. Don't like to be like t authoring and, 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 and killing and, and competing. No, they like to help. Yeah. Um, and okay, that seems strange. The, the, the game in the world most, no, most known for PvP is full of helpers. But it just so happens that in this pain and suffering, there's a lot of people that need help. Yeah. So over time, over these 20 years, we have accumulated these beautiful souls that love helping others. And that then expresses back to planet Earth of like, they also like to help just everywhere. Uh, it's hard to add to that. Congratulations <laughs> on that. I mean, in having a player base that is, like, as you said, full yeah. of helpers in yeah. real world and in uh, the EVE universe. Yes. So speaking of the EVE universe, looking ahead, uh, you today were talking about your plans to create Eve Forever. Yes. And I know that part of that is also rethinking how new players can get engaged more quickly yeah. in the game. What are yeah. some things that you would like to do? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a long way in just making the, 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 the mode of playing spaceships um, uh, easier to get into like make it more intuitive in the beginning, make it more visceral, et cetera. It is quite abstract. Like you're playing a spaceship in the third person. It has a lots of butts on, and it's like complicated machinery. And, and, and it just needs explanation. Like it is the, the, the conceit is already foreign. Yeah. So, uh, we have long since thought about, okay, is there a way to have a game begin with a more intuitive way? Like the, um, the, the Minecraft is a is a great example of a product where you just know what to do from the get go. Like, okay, you hit the floor a few times and there's a hole. Okay, you're in love. Like it just like it backs to happen. And then I get a pickaxe and I'm doing it now. And now I'm in a hole. And I'm just doing it. <laughs> oh, let's try to make a ladder. And like the first five minutes of Minecraft are beautiful. It's yeah. just all intuitive. There's no text. It's all pre linguistic in a way. Yeah. You just know what to do. Children know what to do, adults what to do, and it's delightful for everyone. Okay, is there a way to make the entry into the world more intuitive? I'm not trying to teach you to be a space pilot out the gate. Like, that might come, but okay, what do you do first? And we have thought about this a lot. And, and, and when we look at sort of adjacencies, like e-players, what other games do people play, etc., shooters come up quite mm. a bit. And... Shooters, especially modern day shooters, are very satisfying in their interaction. Like you have a gun, it's on the screen, you press the trigger button, and it just like increasingly so. I mean, gun feel in FPS is a, is a major discipline by now. It just feels great. Um, and it's very intuitive. And it's also violent, which feeds into the capitalistic hellscape and all that. Um, like the Minecraft in Online, line, uh, maybe later, but you're like, okay, what is a way to just kind of get into this magic of like pain and suffering, requiring helpers and beauty emerging and love and friendship and all that. Okay. A shooter seems like a good way <laughs> to, to, to make that. So, so we have tried that quite a bit. Okay. We've, we've made many shooters. Uh, some we have released, some we have not released and, and whatnot, but we were now on Friday announcing Evangard, which is kind of a shooter module inside this in the site this universe, which you will be able to play if you have Eve subscription in December, mm -hmm. the first strike event. So get That's all my right around the corner. Yeah, it's right around the corner. I'm making sure I get all my peer points across. <laughs> um, but but the, the thing is, okay, it's easier to start there and then maybe like aspire to for world domination. And and also I believe we can make digital physics and, and economy constructs, etc. So that like really your next shot could topple an empire. Mm -hmm. There is a very aspiring concept in and of itself. I have often sure heard from players that play shooters is that it can be a little bit sort of monotonous of like nothing really changes. You're, yeah. you're just doing the same thing over and over again and hoping to get somewhere on the ladder. But isn't the fact that you could like really like dictate terms for a universe through your actions with just like a, on your feet with a gun. So. So we are we are now adding that in this way of like, okay, is there another parallel path where you can enter into the world of New Eden, which is kind of the tapestry of the world, other than like starting in space, learning how to fly spaceships. Of course, we make that better and better, and it's already kind of getting better every decade. But okay, by having another sort of 
using terminology like a funnel into the world that is just more immediately intuitive. It's more immediately familiar. Uh, can feel is correct. Like everything works like you know it works. I mean, millions, hundreds of millions of people are pseudo aspects by now. Is that a way to kind of create a stream of, of, of new kind of people joining this magic machine that Eve is? I, that's well, so for somebody like me who is not a space pilot, mm. uh, I but who is very interested in getting into a game that has that promise of complexity. Mm-hmm. That sounds really great. Yeah. So, is the fantasy that I could jump in, use mechanics that I already know fairly yeah. well from playing shooters, and eventually get to the point where I could own my own spaceship, buy a spaceship, and sort of it's an easier on ramp into that space part of the game? Is that? Or or are they two separate modules of the mm-hmm. experience? So they are a little bit like the specialization we were talking about in the beginning. So if you're making arrows, I'm shooting the arrows and somebody's curing the skins and the and the meat. So I could become an arrow maker and you could become a bow shooter. Like we could do both. Okay. But the magic is if where everyone plays a role in the grander fantasy of what we're doing. So if the Usually the the, the 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 allure of an Eve alliance is world domination. So if we are to attempt world domination in Eve, then you need to have boots on the ground and pilots in space. So everyone plays a part in doing that. Okay. So it's not necessarily that you go from shooting to flying spaceships. It is we are making arrows and hunting deer and curing it together, all in our separate discipline, except it's not only ours, it's knives and it's pots and it's like how to make fire and how to build houses and how to how to make philosophy like all of that so we're adding this new way to contribute to the overall grand scheme of the space adventure that team online is but you can do that solely from the ground you can do both you can do all of it some people do all of it it's a lot of work i don't know how they do it but they pull it off or you can just really focus on one thing and become awesome at it i gotta imagine that when vanguard comes out you're gonna the social stratifica- stratification that you're going to see is going to be really fun to study. Yeah, it, it's going to be right because you, bo- you said boots on the ground, but yep. then I'm thinking you got some admirals up there in ships. And, uh, wait a second. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And the more ways to contribute and experience we add, the more like uh, the word inclusive fits very well. Like the you don't have to like want to fly spaceships. You like it's you. You can also do this, and you can also maybe in the future just cook food. Um, yeah, it's currently not a, a feature, but at some point, <laughs> all these troops need food. That's right, and you got if you're going to be on a ship too, you want to have a pretty good, you know, Conceive. experience, yes. right, <laughs> on your ship. You yeah. got to have a good cook. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, that sounds fascinating. So, sort of the last couple of questions for you. You today on stage, you were talking about how this game can continue to live. And that's sort of the vision for yeah. what's happening now. How do you stay in the industry? How do you keep the energy up? And because you've been in the industry for a long time. Yeah. And what motivates you every single day to come back and keep pushing? So, uh, I mean, I, I'm uh, in a bit of a pink cloud right now because we had FanFest last week. Okay. Like, <laughs> it's just like meeting uh, thousands of people that love the game. It's extraordinarily empowering and empowering. Like it's just like it's like an elixir that is like bottled up through this event, and we're just like kind of mainlining it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like it's just like it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, that's well. It is the players that power us, right? Yes. As developers, we yes. do that. We do what we do for the players, and it totally makes sense that you've got twenty years yes. of enthusiastic fans who are saying, "Please more." Yes. Well, congratulations to you and to CCP on an amazing run. And I personally am excited to try out uh, Vanguard yep. coming up and yep. and get into the universe. I'm excited to hear what you think in <laughs> December, being a, a craftsman of the, of the construct yourself. Like, <laughs> I, I look forward to the feedback. Right on. Thanks, Omar. Thank you.